all serial killers psychopaths? going to discuss psychopathy, violence and serial crime and one of the biggest issues that arises in relation to serial crime and the biggest questions is whether all of the serial offenders are in fact psychopaths. Today we're going to look at the relationship between psychopathy and violence and then what does all that mean for psychopathy and serial crime. We'll discuss some of the main and most notorious offenders including Ted Bundy, Gary Ridgway, Edmund Kemper, Aileen Warnos and lastly but not least a recent one in the UK by a female named Joanne Denny. And one of the greatest challenges with psychopathy is not getting caught up in all the academic conversation and still understanding what it all means for clinical and operational utility around understanding and working with these individuals. Now, one of the best ways to conceptualise psychopathy and to think about what exactly is psychopathy is in terms of a really useful quote from Poloshek and Scheme. And they, ref they refer to psychopathy as a form of personality pathology associated with varying degrees of social harm. So essentially we're saying that harm arises when we're dealing with psychopathic personality but it varies based on degree. And when we're talking about violence and criminality, we're often talking about observable and physical harm. When we're talking about things such as non-criminal psychopathy, then we may be talking about emotional or psychological harm, so things that are not as observable. Now, there's another really useful and fascinating quote from Sigmund Freud. There's a description that captures psychopathy and as Freud notes two traits are essential in a criminal. Boundless egoism and a strong destructive urge. Common to both of these and a necessary condition for their expression is an absence of love, a lack of emotional appreciation of humans and objects. Now the first comprehensive clinical conceptualization of psychopathy was provided by Harvey Cleckley in his book titled The Mask of Sanity which was first published in 1941 and Cleckley believed that psychopaths had the ability to present as personable, confident and well adjusted in comparison to say mentally ill or psychiatric patients. However, Behind the mask was a character that revealed a severe underlying pathology and this really leaked out through their actions and attitudes. So initially it was difficult to see how these individuals presented and they appeared very well adjusted but over time the true underlying character would emerge. And Cleckley believed that psychopathy or psychopaths were not in fact predatory, violent or cruel, but that the harm that arose and was associated with psychopathy was really a secondary consequence of their tendency towards being shallow and freckless rather than necessarily being a violent individual. But in recent years there's commonly been a theme that's emerged around psychopathy, particularly with a focus on criminality and violence. Now, Robert Hare built on the work of Cleckley, and Hare operationalised the construct of psychopathy, essentially turning it into something that has greater clinical utility. And he identified 20 core characteristics that he argued depicted the psychopathic personality. And really, Hare has established himself as the leading expert in the field of psychopathy for quite a number of decades now. And through this work, he developed the psychopathy checklist revised, which particularly when we're talking about assessing psychopathy in offenders or in the criminal population, it really is the gold standard assessment tool for this. And his characteristics were based on his interview protocol, so the psychopathy checklist, and much of this conceptualization of psychopathy 
emerged through his work on criminal samples with North American criminal offenders. And Hare believed that impulsivity and aggression were a core trait of psychopathy rather than it being a secondary characteristic as described by Cleckley. And when Hare broke down his version and conceptualization of psychopathy, it was really this combination of interpersonal, affective, lifestyle and antisocial traits that all merged together to represent the psychopathic personality. So we have the psychopathy checklist revised, which is really our primary tool if we want to look at psychopathic personality amongst offenders. We also have another measure called the psychopathic personality inventory revised, which is a self-report tool. And it's had use across a number of different domains from criminal offenders, community samples, and all the way through to looking at individuals in the business setting. So it's quite a diverse tool. The challenge of a self-report measure is, of course, that we need to be mindful of the potential for self-report bias and for individuals to potentially manipulate and try and convey a certain impression on the instrument. Then we have the comprehensive assessment of psychopathic personality, which has really emerged in probably the past five to six years. And that's got useful utility across a number of different settings, whether it be community-based or whether that be in, in custody. And it's an emerging instrument that's still going through the process of being validated, but it's certainly appearing as a promising tool that may rival or sit alongside the psychopathy checklist revised. Then we have the triarchic psychopathy measure, which centers on the idea that psychopathy is characterized by three overarching features. And it's really this intersection between these features that creates a psychopathic personality. So the three overarching constructs of the triarchic model are boldness, meanness, and disinhibition. But to date, the measure seems to have had greater utility and use in research settings rather than having use as a clinical instrument. We also have the elemental psychopathy assessment, which is based on the five-factor personality model. So the measure is derived and based on that. And again, it's a tool that's currently being developed, but I think it's one that we would watch closely in terms of looking at whether there is clinical utility based on this self-report measure. And then we also have the self-report psychopathy scale, which has been around for several years and it's now in the fourth version, but probably more so a research instrument rather than having clinical utility. So we have our different measures to examine psychopathy, but Essentially, we're talking about a personality style and a personality disposition. And when it comes to offenders, we need to think about what does psychopathy actually appear and present like? Well, let's take this example, for instance. There are an infinite number of ways to explain how a man can come to the point where he destroys human life. good-looking girl and one minute I'd be thinking how nice it'd be to go out with her and then the next instant I was thinking how nice her head would look on a stick so that was a clip of Ted Bundy discussing his offending with a former detective Robert Keppel in the documentary Ted Bundy mind of a monster and we'll come back later to talk further about Bundy but it's very hard to talk about psychopathy violence and serial crime without Bundy being at the centre of this conversation. 
And when we think about psychopathy and violence, there's some very interesting work conducted by Delisi, and he speaks about essentially a unified theory of crime. And according to Delisi, many offenders have behavioural histories that reflect self-regulation deficits, impulsivity, pervasive irresponsibility, and a dereliction of the most fundamental responsibilities to family, friends, teachers, employers, and others. They lie, cheat, blame their problems on others, and are often mean. Moreover, they behave like a cancer that weakens and too often destroys others who are unfortunate to have come into contact with them. So according to Delisi, psychopathy is the purest, most parsimonious and arguably best explanation for criminal and antisocial behaviour. And this underpins what we touched on moments before, Delisi's theory of a unified theory of crime, which is essentially that all dimensions and aspects of criminal behaviour can be understood by understanding psychopathy. But we also have an opposing view of that as well. So we certainly have one camp that argues and similar in many ways to the work or the differences between Hare and Cleckley. But we have one camp that argues that essentially criminal behaviour is intertwined into the psychopathic personality. But then we have another side who are more cautious and Polishek provides a very valuable quote here that criminals are neither inevitably psychopathic nor are psychopaths inevitably criminal. So we have two opposing opinions. One is that psychopathy is essentially equated with violence and the other is that psychopathy is associated with violence but this relationship is not causative. So, yes, at times, psychopathic individuals commit violence and criminal behaviour, but it's not an absolute. And there are many cases, of course, where this doesn't arise. And these two views tend to be at the core of at least the academic argument about psychopathy. And probably the best way to view this is that we have the core personality features then we have the behavioural outcomes that arise from the personality. Now, my opinion is that violence is not a core characteristic or a core personality feature of psychopathy, but it is an outcome that often arises, or as Cleckley would state, a secondary consequence of that personality style. So many psychopaths are violent, but in some cases, this is also not the case. So we have individuals that do manage to avoid incarceration and others that even manage to attain positions of accomplishment or success in society. So it's not necessarily solely equated with violence, even though there tends to be some form of relationship. We do also, of course, get the, the opposing view as well, where there are cases where violence doesn't arise. So we won't delve into the non-criminal aspect in our conversation, but of course our focus is on looking at psychopathy and violence and particularly the relationship that this has with serial crime. So in terms of understanding and looking at what we know about psychopathy and crime, we know that consistently through research there's been a number of observations relating to psychopathic individuals and criminal behaviour. And in one of the early studies by Hare and McPherson, they found that psychopathic individuals engaged in greater levels of violence and aggression. They were more likely to use a weapon to commit a violent assault, and they're also more likely to engage in violence when in custody. They were also more likely to perpetrate planned, calculated and considered acts of violence rather than reactive and impulsive acts of violence. So that, of course, is not saying that we don't get some psychopathic individuals that do enact impulsive acts and reactive forms of violence, but amongst psychopathic offenders, there's a clear pattern of instrumental and calculated violence. 
They're also more likely to possess cognitions that are supportive of violence and aggression. So essentially what we're saying here is they're more prone to having violent thoughts, potentially even violent ideation. They're also more likely to threaten and challenge those perceived to be blocking their pursuit of goals. So if you're in the way, then of course you're at a risk when the individual that wants you removed is a psychopathic person. So if you're blocking their goals, they will resort to different tactics, again, in an instrumental nature to remove you to achieve that goal. It's also arguably and generally consistently supported a moderate predictor of most forms of crime and future violence. Now, there's certainly an argument about whether psychopathy should be considered as a risk factor for violence, but we do see that there is a relationship there. But again, it's certainly not applicable to all psychopathic individuals. Offenders with psychopathy tend to be around five times more likely, though, to re-offend violently within five years of prison release. And when we're thinking about prevalence rates amongst offenders, around about 15 to 25% of offenders are considered psychopathic. But if we contrast that to antisocial personality disorder, the rate's a lot lower. So our folks with antisocial personality tend to be about 50 to 80% of the prison population. But antisocial PD predominantly is really associated with criminality. And when we look across offenders, we see that there's a number of different etiological courses. There's differences between psychopathy and antisocial personality in how the disorder is expressed. And of course, there's also differences in the offending. And one of the main things is we have this antisocial disposition versus a callous and quite notable individual with a lower physiological arousal to threat and fear. Whereas what we see in the antisocial individual is they're often quite reactive and quite emotional, which we just rarely see with psychopathic individuals. Now, when we think about psychopathy and crime, one thing that's quite interesting and it has been observed across a number of research studies is that across crime behaviour, there's definitely differences between crimes that are perpetrated by psychopathic individuals versus those with other more acute forms of mental illness. So the psychopathic individual tends to carry out crimes that are instrumentally motivated. So we're talking, of course, we're talking more around likelihoods here rather than absolutes, but motivation often relates to revenge, relates to things such as greed, which is commonly financially driven, particularly in the case of corporate crime, thrill and excitement. This is a big factor when we're thinking about sexual types of crime and of course power and dominance so that can also be the case when we're looking at certain types of murder they generally will target and select their victim so it's a deliberate planned act rather than a spontaneous or reactive type of crime they're more likely to torture their victim or engage in sadistic acts so including cutting the victim and even when they do perpetrate impulsive based murder there's still evidence that they tend to essentially clean up the crime scene. So we might find that the victim of a psychopathic offender is removed from the crime scene. We would also find that there's evidence that's been removed along with it commonly having the weapon removed. They'll also more likely take precautionary measures to avoid detection. And this might be during and also post-crime. And the violence is enough to carry out the act. So what that means is essentially the, the, the dosage of violence in many ways is sufficient to carry out the intention of the act. But probably the exception to that is when we have psychopathic personality coupled with sadism. So in that situation, we may find that there's excessive violence, but we certainly don't see the level of overkill that we would with a mentally ill offender. And in many ways, these psychopathic crime scene behaviours, 
are similar to the organised offender profile that we have seen in the FBI profiling methods. Then we move over to the mentally ill offender who often feels commanded or compelled to action and their behaviour is often in an attempt to relief an intense emotional experience. An obsession and fixation is also an additional driving factor but there's commonly this build up of intense emotionality and pressure and it's relieved after perpetrating the crime. And what we would find is that they're unable to separate their thoughts and fantasies from reality. So essentially, everything becomes fused and they lose the ability to differentiate thought from everyday life. It all becomes blended into one. And with mentally ill crime, it's very common that there's excessive violence and overkill and that the crime scene will often appear quite odd and bizarre. It's also likely that it's unsophisticated and it's likely that the crime will be quite chaotic and there will also be evidence potentially of staging in the case that they have panicked as well. So often the crime scene will look a complete mess. There will be considerable traces therefore of evidence that will remain. The victim is typically left at the crime scene along with the weapon and we're really talking about varying degrees of mental illness in this situation. So probably the more psychotic they are, the more they're likely to fit this model. But we also talk about people with general levels of mental illness. So that could be severe mood disorders all the way through to active or even early psychosis. And an example of this would be the case of Andrea Yates who murdered her five children through drowning them. And of course the mentally ill characteristics do share similarities to the disorganized offender in the FBI profile. So let's move on to talking about serial crime and what this means in relation to psychopathy. Well, when we talk about serial crime and psychopathic individuals, who are we in fact talking about? Well, the first person that really is most apparent is Ted Bundy. During the 1970s, Ted Bundy was responsible for the deaths of multiple young women across several states in the USA. And in the hours prior to his execution, Bundy confessed to perpetrating 30 homicides, many of which involved rape, kidnapping and necrophilia. And Bundy's notoriety certainly did not cease with his offending. So he escaped from custody and also represented himself during his court trials, of which he was adamant that he was innocent and it was only really in the dying hours before his execution that he essentially tried to play his final card by providing investigators with details about the crimes, but that of course was not enough to prevent his execution. And he was described by author Anne Rule, who once worked with Bundy as a sadistic sociopath who took pleasure from another human's pain and the control he had over his victims to the point of their death and even after. And by far one of the most concerning features to Bundy's offending was his method of targeting his victims which were very calculated and Robert Hare, in his book Without Conscience, describes this very well. So he states that Bundy brought himself a pair of crutches and even went so far as to give the appearance of putting his leg in a cast. So this temporarily disabled him and he asked for assistance from sympathetic young women who may cross the road to avoid an individual who makes attempts at talking to them, but they would be more likely and readily to stop and lend a hand when an individual is struggling and particularly appearing to have a broken leg. And Bundy varied the theme sometimes. So other times his arm was in a sling and he would find a victim that was willing to help him out on a busy street. At other times with his leg problem, he would target young women at recreational areas, stating things such as just down the road to his car and in many ways, as Hare states, it was a terrible ploy, but also a stroke of genius in being able to lure victims in. Let me start this way. I understand that at the, the Issaquah site, 
there were remains of three individuals found, two identified and one not. The unidentified remains, uh, uh, I can whisper it to you. Or, uh, well, if you can, can you hear that? I can hear you. Okay. The name that was George Ann Hawkins. Probably you found damage to the head. The jaw in particular probably broken. to 12, probably closer to 12, on a warm Seattle night, I think it was clear, and he was moving up the alley using a briefcase and some crutches, and the young woman walked down toward me, and about halfway down the block I encountered her and asked her to help me carry the briefcase, which she did, and we walked back up the alley. <laughs> Basically, when I reached the car, what happened was I knocked her, knocked her unconscious with the crowbar. And then there were some, there were some handcuffs there along with the crowbar. I handcuffed her and put her in the passenger side of the car and drove away. Everybody called her George. <laughs> so it's funny, it's, it's fun, not funny, but it's odd that kind of things people say under those circumstances. And she said that she thought that she had a Spanish test the next day, and she thought that I had taken her to help tutor me for a Spanish test. Uh, odd thing to say. short of it was that I again knocked her unconscious and strangled her and drove her into the small grove of trees that was there. The Hawkins girl's head was severed and taken up the road about 25 to 50 yards and buried in a location about 10 yards west of the road on a rocky hillside. Now, we move on to Edmund Kemper. And Kemper is an enormous man standing at around 6 foot 9, 6 foot 8, just over 2 metres. And he was known as the co-ed killer. And he, in many ways, he was quite skilled in committing his crimes. So there certainly was a level of organisation about his crimes, although at times he did display a level of impulsivity as well, but nonetheless definitely led more towards the organised category. And he also possessed a reported IQ that was between 130 and 150. And he was remarkably cold and callous in carrying out his crimes, which of course some of these were quite horrific. And before Kemper would go on to become the co-ed killer and eventually murder six young women, he killed his paternal grandparents when he was 15 years of age. 
And after murdering them, he was placed in a psychiatric hospital following these murders. And at the time, he was considered to have paranoid schizophrenia. Although I think when we now look back at this, it's quite likely that this diagnosis, diagnosis was questionable. And it was possibly more likely that we were talking about psychopathy instead. So he spent about six years in hospitalisation before he was released back to the community at 21 years of age. And over the coming years, Kemper picked up young female hitchhikers, murdering them in the woods, then bringing their bodies home, decapitating and dismembering them, and ultimately he would then go on to engage in sexual acts with the bodies. He also eventually went on to murder his mother, whom he had a strong disdain and hatred towards. And most alarmingly in killing his mother, he cut her head off and then proceeded to humiliate her further by having sex with her head. After that, he then went on to invite her friend over and also murdered her before he was finally incarcerated and, and of course, convicted. I'm saying I've wanted to kill my mother since I was eight years old, and I'm not proud of that. It started with surrogates at, at a non-human level. Physical objects, my possessions, other people's, destruction of things that are cared about, and then destruction of things that are living on a lower level, small animals, uh, insects, animals, and then finally people. It started coming to a head again, so I went back down. I ran away back down there. And then a month later, I'm up living with my grandparents in the mountains, and 10 months later, I murdered them. And it made it worse to be on top of a mountain. I was literally on top of a mountain when it happened. And I could sense, I sensed everybody in the world just stopping what they were doing, turning around, saw what I did, and are coming to get me. And I knew I was paranoid at that moment. I knew anybody that came up there and gave me a funny look or a fishy eye or quizzical look, I'd have blown their brains out thinking they were coming to get me. And if it had been in a city, I would have been a mass murderer at age 15. I would have killed until they gunned me down. I wouldn't have been able to reason my way out of it. I was scared to death and I was violent. I felt my back hit that wall. I was the rabbit that always ran, that always backed away, always burned his bridges. And suddenly there weren't any more. And I, my back hit that wall and I came out screaming and kicking and shooting. When Four months after I was out, I was back into the fantasy bag. My first date was an absolute disaster. It wasn't her fault, you know? And I didn't blame her even then, I'm saying. It was a terrible tragedy, but boy, was it, boy, she didn't ever talk to me again. It was awful. It wasn't sexual or grabbing at her or anything. I was just such a dork, taking her to a John Wayne movie in uh, Denny's. And it was terrible. I'd never been on a date at 16. That was cool, you know? I'd never been on a date, you know? I was locked up since I was 15. But I can't tell her that. Oh, gee, you don't mind me. You know, she kind of got hung up on my looks or whatever. You know, I mean, she's a gorgeous young lady pure class, and she saw something there that I guess wasn't there, and boy, she found out quick. I was losing a grasp on something that was too violent to keep inside forever. As I'm sitting there with a severed head in my hand, talking to it, or looking at it, and I'm about to go crazy, literally. I'm about to go completely flywheel loose and just fall apart. I say, wow, this is insane. And then I told myself, no, it isn't. You're saying that, and that makes it not insane. I said, I'm sane, and I'm looking at a seven. I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I see old ink paints, paintings and drawings of Viking heroes talking to severed heads and taking them to parties, old enemies and leather bags. Part of our heritage. The next of our serial murderers is Gary Ridgway, who was known as the Green River Killer and was one of the most prolific American serial killers of all time. And it took several years extensive police resources to catch Ridgeway and ultimately he was convicted of 49 murders but he did confess to 71 murders but the exact number of these could be even more. Now he came to the attention of police several times during the Green River investigation and also passed a polygraph during this period of time and that of course does bring the polygraph into question, which is one of the reasons that we see that the polygraph tends not to be admissible in court. Now, Ridgway targeted primarily young girls who were often sex workers or 
highly vulnerable or had run away from home and didn't have close family ties. And he'd lure the girls into his truck, have sex with them, murder them, and then would often also again engage in sexual acts with them once they were deceased. And during his crimes, Ridgway was capable of maintaining relationships with other women and also maintaining employment throughout all of his period of offending. And it's quite likely that he was probably killing from at least 1982 up until his arrest in 2001. And what's interesting about Ridgway is that he had a remarkable capacity, like with a lot of serial offenders, to compartmentalise his tendencies towards sexual violence whilst still being able to convey a veneer of normality. The devil's in my head, the, the, the rage. I had control and that's what it all comes down to is control of those bitches. During the confessions, we kept him in a secret location. He's the most violent, dark-sided individual I've ever interviewed. I am the killer that did it, and I'm trying to help you find these bodies. Ridgeway had kept this enormous secret, even from the people he was closest to, his wife, his son. He'd never told anyone what he had done until he started the interviews with us. I just love killing women, maybe. I didn't have no morals, conscience didn't stop me. I want to be the best serial killer out there. It was just a killing spree of going for the cow. I went 100 this year. Now, Aileen Warnos is one of the few female American serial killers, and the extent of her crimes was depicted in the Oscar winning movie Monster. Now, she suffered a very abusive childhood, which included both physical and sexual abuse. And due to this, she left home at an early age during her teenage years and began hitchhiking and engaging in sex work to survive. She had a relationship with both males and females. And at the time of committing the murders, she was dating Tyria Moore, who also was initially facing charges relating to the crimes. But after making a deal with the prosecution, Moore was able to elicit a phone confession from Warnos, who spoke about murdering the six men over a period of 12 to 18 months. And this led to her eventually being arrested in 1991. So in committing her crimes, Warnos commonly killed the men under the pretense of getting into their vehicles as a sex worker, then murdering and robbing them. I killed those seven men in first degree murder and robbery. As they said, they had it right, a serial killer. Not so much like thrill kill. I was into the robbing biz. I mean, you know, serial killers are in this thrill killing jazz. I was into the robbing, just and eliminate a witness. But still, then again, I got a number, so it's serial killer. But I'm coming clean before I go in that execution chamber and be executed that uh, I killed them. And so like when this. you met them from the beginning, did you know that you were going to kill them? when they picked you up in their cars? I pretty much, <clears throat> I have pretty much had them so, uh, selected that they were gonna die. And lastly, another example of a female serial murder has arisen recently in the UK. Now, in 2013, Joanne Denny engaged in a 10-day violent murder spree. During this time, Denny murdered three men and attempted to kill another two, with the mayhem transpiring over a 10-day violent spree that was exceptionally erratic, cruel, and also involved both co-offenders and victims that were known as well as being unknown to her. So, with all the different murders and the crimes, Denny committed these by stabbing each of the victims. Now, at the time of sentencing, the sentencing judge described her as cruel, calculating, selfish, and a manipulative serial killer. And during the course of the trial and with the case 
examining the psychological underpinnings of Danny, she was assessed as being psychopathic, along with having the paraphilic condition of sadomasochism. So let's now take a closer look at what we know from the research about psychopathy and serial crime. And in a 2018 chapter, Hickey and colleagues provide a really important discussion and analysis in relation to psychopathy and serial crime. Now, according to Hickey and colleagues, the most pervasive misperception about serial crime is that all serial murders are psychopaths. What Hickey raises as a question and source of contention is, are the other factors and traits of psychopathy present? So, do we have the tendency towards being bold and fearless, or are there additional features around disinhibition and impulsive tendencies that emerge? So, essentially, Hickey is arguing that we need this combination of traits to be present, which is largely true. So, the point in the chapter that they make is that we're talking about psychopathic personality, but are we talking about features of psychopathy or pervasive levels of psychopathy? And as part of their review and analysis of psychopathy and serial crime, they took five cases and analysed these in relation to the psychopathy checklist revised and looked at the score that emerged across ratings for these five serial offenders. Now, the psychopathy checklist commonly recommends a diagnostic cutoff of 30 out of 40 on the measure. And to determine someone psychopathic on the measure, then that score of 30 is typically required. But we will come back to that shortly. So amongst the five offenders, Hickey and colleagues believe that only Ted Bundy met the diagnostic threshold to be considered as psychopathic. And that's represented there by a score of 34 on the measure. But we also have, of course, John Wayne Gacy and Edmund Kemper that do score with certainly notable elevated psychopathic traits. And this is really an interesting position in terms of do we require that score of 30 to say that these individuals may be psychopathic? And a similar point could potentially also be made for Gary Ridgway. So I largely agree with these findings. Probably the only one I would caution here is the results relating to Ridgway. And there's some interesting things that are worth considering in relation to this. So it's evident that Ridgway has lower antisocial and lifestyle traits, which is apparent by his factor 2 score of 4.5. But he still does display considerable interpersonal and affective features, which is shown by the factor 1 score, which of course are the core features of psychopathy. Now, the antisocial aspect and the impulsivity aspect are somewhat contentious at times in the psychopathy field, particularly amongst academics. So, do you have to be impulsive to be a psychopath? Well, according to Woodworth and Porter, psychopaths can have what is termed selective impulsivity. So, psychopathic people may behave in a more instrumental manner based on the gravity or seriousness of an event or situation. So, planning their actions in a calculating manner may occur when it's a high-stakes situation, such as the perpetration of an act of homicide, where obviously the consequences are very high, the stakes are very high. If they're caught, they're facing a lifetime of incarceration. So Woodworth and Porter highlight that psychopathic offending can be instrumental in nature, and there is a tendency towards selective impulsivity, but this may also vary as a function of the individual's level of disinhibition. So if the person has greater interpersonal 
and effective features, but fewer of these lifestyle and antisocial traits, then we need to be careful in excluding psychopathy. So when it comes to Ridgeway, there's probably a debate around, are we talking about someone with more so a narcissistic personality disorder or arguably a form of primary psychopathy where they display mostly the interpersonal and effective core personality features. And this also, of course, is an interesting argument in relation to Kemper and Gacy, both whose score lower on the factor two traits, but higher on the factor one traits. So essentially we're saying very high on the core personality features, not as high on the behavioral aspects. Now, we also have a body of research though that has argued that there is a reasonably strong relationship between psychopathy and serial crime. Now, Logan and Hare estimate that 90% of serial murders display psychopathic personality disorder. And this has been found and reflected across several studies. So Dobert in a 2009 paper found that 18 out of 22 serial murders were considered to be psychopathic, although there has been some criticism, particularly by Hickey and colleagues, in relation to potentially antisocial personality disorder being conflated with psychopathy in this study. Then Lebrode, in a 2007 paper, essentially went through a number of serial offenders, including Bundy, Gacy, Dharma, Kemper, Ed Gein, Gary Ridgway, and of course, Dennis Radar, the BTK killer, and believed that all of these individuals were in fact psychopathic. Although it's not clear whether this conclusion was based upon Lebrode's opinion or from having conducted assessments on case information in relation to these individuals. Now, in another paper, Silver and colleagues found that Jeffrey Dahmer had a score of 22 out of 40 on the PCLR, so again, was sitting more around the mid-range on psychopathy rather than at that higher echelon of traits. Now, that score of Dharma is pretty much consistent with the score found by Hickey and colleagues, and I think we can probably have a level of confidence that in relation to Dharma's case, that he may not have met the criteria for psychopathic personality. Then in another study by Dudek in 2001, looking at serial murders versus single homicide offenders, serial murders were found to all be higher on the interpersonal and effective features of psychopathy. They also had an average score of 31 out of 40. So essentially we're finding that the average of that sample were all above that 30 threshold. And the single homicide offenders were below that threshold. But interestingly, there was no difference observed between serial and single homicide offenders for factor two scores. Then we look at a paper by Norris in 2011, which examined Bundy, Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, BTK, so Dennis Radar, Elizabeth Bathory, Jane Toppin, and Aileen Warnos. Now amongst these, Norris found that only Bundy was above 30 on the PCLR, so somewhat consistent with Hickey, although the male score amongst these three individuals was 24.3, which again, we could make some argument to say that that's a certainly a high mean score of psychopathy, and we would want to inspect that further to work out what exactly the loading of those traits were. And the mean score for females was 19. Then we look at a paper by Michael Stone in 2001, which looked at 99 serial murderers. And amongst these individuals, according to Stone, 91% met the criteria, that 30 threshold to be considered as psychopathic. And the research by Stone certainly offers an important understanding into the rare and disturbing nature of serial murder. And one of the interesting aspects was the 
number of co-occurring personality disorders that Stone also found. So 81% also met the criteria for antisocial personality disorder. 60% met the criteria for narcissistic personality disorder. And around about 50% also met the criteria for schizoid personality disorder. So probably the easiest takeaway from this is personality pathology was rife amongst the sample, but psychopathy certainly emerged as the most prevalent. And amongst these 99 individuals, Stone found 106 counts of paraphilic behaviour across these offenders. And this included sexual sadism and necrophilia being the most common types of paraphilias, followed by pedophilia, voyeurism, bondage and cannibalism. And it, the paper really highlighted the crossover between psychopathic personality and paraphilias, with paraphilias being these sexual interests that are above and beyond the standards of normative social behaviour or interest. And there's a number of different paraphilias which we won't go into as they are a rather unique and fascinating field unto themselves. But the research by Stone has received some criticism, particularly by Hickey and colleagues, in that it was conducted by only him and it was reliant on biographical information across the 99 cases to score the PCLR. So there's some concern about what level of information or what was the threshold of information used to determine psychopathy and due to the lack of interrelator reliability or oversight over this research, we probably do need to have some caution in interpreting these results, but it's still very valuable and interesting nonetheless. So. How do we make sense of what all this means in relation to psychopathy and serial crime? Well, firstly, psychopathy is characterised by life course persistent traits and behaviours. Now, one of the things that we need to remember is that a singular act of violence shouldn't be how we solely determine a person's level of psychopathy. We need to be basing this on their history of personality, their history of behaviour across their lifetime to that date. Now, serial murder is a rare occurrence and we have a limited number of individuals that we can examine to reach conclusions. And of course, some offenders are apprehended for single acts of violence even though there may be suspected repeated victims. So one is that some individuals have multiple victims, but they're only ever apprehended for one. The other aspect here is they have the propensity to be a serial murderer and they're apprehended in a much quicker fashion, particularly after the first case. So this does impede our ability to of course, analyse and make definitive conclusions about serial crime. And then another issue is, does psychopathy differ between those that are apprehended and those that are undetected? And the example of this, of course, would have to be one of the more famous or infamous serial offenders that's never been caught, which is the Zodiac Killer, who was active in California between the 60s and 70s. So... Do we say that those that aren't detected are more likely to be psychopathic or is it the psychopathy that potentially brings these individuals undone and the ones that may in fact be less psychopathic are the ones that may in fact never be caught? So there's a number of questions that still remain and make us pause for consideration when looking to reach a conclusion. But of course, there are some things that we do need to consider that may influence our judgment on this domain. And one of these is that we can get very caught up on the score of 30 as indicating whether someone is psychopathic or not. 
And Hare himself has provided a really valuable quote which provides some greater clarity around the importance of not getting stuck on this 30 figure. Now, according to Hare, psychopathy is defined by having a heavy dose of the features that comprise the disorder. The threshold for high blood pressure or for a label of hypertensive is somewhat arbitrary but typically falls in a range where there's an increased risk to the individual's health. The threshold for psychopathy is also somewhat arbitrary but generally is set rather high at a level where the individual's manipulative, callous, egocentric, predatory, irresponsible and remorseless behaviours begin to infringe upon the rights and safety of others. Now, I think that is a really valuable quote and it's a really useful clinical way to be able to look at cases. Now, the only temptation is that it's very hard to look at that quote and think that it doesn't largely apply to all serial offenders because they certainly infringe upon the rights and safety of others. But I think it highlights that we need to make sure that we are not excluding people because they don't reach a certain threshold. And there is a balance point along that continuum of psychopathic traits where, as Hare states, the greater number of traits and the greater impact that we can demonstrate that those traits have on an individual's livelihood and the livelihood of others then potentially the more likely they are to be psychopathic. So I think we need to make sure that we don't get caught up on whether someone is impulsive or isn't impulsive, or whether they're disinhibited or not disinhibited, etc. And the clinical utility and conceptualization and operationalization of psychopathy is really important when we're looking at serial crime. But of course, we then have to balance that out as well. So we can't think that all psychopaths are potentially serial offenders in waiting. And Polishak and Hickey do make the important point that disinhibitory characteristics such as substance use, deviancy, paraphilias and impulsivity may be greater predictors of violence than the totality of psychopathic personality. So what we're saying here is that there are other contributors to violent crime without it solely needing to be equated with psychopathic individuals. But I would then caution this and note that when we have psychopathic personality combined with paraphilias or paraphilic behaviours, this is highly likely to be a risky and dangerous individual and there's no doubt that across our serial offenders throughout the history we commonly find psychopathic traits plus paraphilic behavior and this combination is essentially in many ways the ultimate platform towards perpetrating serial crime. So there's no set conclusion about whether serial offenders are predominantly psychopathic. My personal belief is that we need to look at serial crime through the lens of psychopathy, start with psychopathy, look to exclude this, and then begin to look at other considerations. I think no doubt that there's a relationship there. We're talking about a very unique rare specific occurrence psychopathy particularly when combined with the presence of paraphilias really does explain a number of serial offenders and a number of serial crimes so if there was a simple conclusion we'd probably say that psychopathy is a common factor in serial crime but of course we pause and say that it's common in many cases but there are also a number of exceptions. So if you're dealing with serial crime, you must consider psychopathy, but of course it's not the sole answer and cause.